10 eShop games worth buying. Now, look, I usually have a boom mic uh, uh, above me, but in the move, I lost the little connector thing to put the mic on. 1.5 million subscribers, and I'm standing here without a boom arm. I appreciate you guys, by the way. We just hit that milestone. That's insane. There's about 10,000 games on the eShop now, and you might be wondering how on God's green earth am I supposed to go through and find the good ones? You don't have to. I have a whole series on this channel called 10 eShop games worth buying. It's been a hot minute since I did one of these because I've been busy moving states. And also I'm super sick right now, which actually has worked out pretty well because all I've been doing recently is vegging out and playing games. So with all that said, I hope you find something you might want to play today. And I think you will. Sorry, I sound so congested, but one like equals one prayer. So you know what to do down below. Drop a sub if you're new here. Maybe comment with your favorite game or what game I should talk about next. Let's just get started. Well, after the sponsor, of course. I gotta pay mortgage. <laughs> Sure, all these eShop games are gonna look fantastic blown up on your TV, but honestly, I'm all about playing portable. And games have never looked better than they do on this crisp OLED screen. Yeah, my only problem is my hands and wrists get crampy so quickly. Well, then I have good news for you and all of you because Satisfy is having their biggest sale of the year right now. Literally the best prices ever just dropped on Satisfy.com. If there was ever a time to pick up one of the very comfortable Satisfy grips or the awesome rise pads, uh, now would be that time. Whoa, their products are all the way up to freaking 65% off right now. Yeah. The Rise Pads are a game changer for any console. And right now there's almost 40% off of a Zen Grip Pro and the bundles are up to 30% off. What's that? You have a Switch Lite? <laughs> well then don't worry about this old guy. You can get 50% off of Zen Grip Go products right now as well. Huh, well I guess I'll order everything oh, now. you idiot. We work with Satisfy. We get all this stuff for free, you dingus. Oh. You're using a beat-em-up sat. It has your name on it. You're using it right now. Right. You guys don't get it for free, though. But if you do use my code BEAT'EMUPS5, you'll get an extra 5% off the already insane sales. Use my link down below, and thank you, Satisfy, for sponsoring. Kicking off this video with the game that I easily spent the most amount of addicted hours in while playing games for this video... Getsu Famuden. Getsu Getsu Famuden? That's probably close. This game is wild. Both the story surrounding the game's release as well as the heart-pounding hack and slash gameplay itself. So I didn't know this, but this game is actually a sequel to the 1987 Famicom game by the same name. It was exclusively released in Japan, but don't worry, you don't have to have played that one to enjoy this one. And also, very fittingly, this new Getsu Famuden is only available on Nintendo Switch. Well, and PC, but we don't count that around here. The best way I can describe it is it's like Dead Cells, but with a really cool Japanese aesthetic. I mean, this art style is jaw-dropping. A gritty, cel-shaded style with vibrant reds and blues contrasting the bleak, neutral tones of the underworld. The blade and weapon effects on each slash are almost as satisfying to watch than the actual attacks are to land. The gameplay itself is so nuanced that I could spend this entire video just trying to explain how to play the game, and you honestly might need me to do that because Getsu Famuden takes the Elden Ring Dark Souls approach of just throwing you into the game, not telling you how anything works and saying good luck, figure it out and try not to die. Just like Dead Cells, you have a small hub area in between runs where you can modify and upgrade your weapons and abilities before heading out into a completely randomly generated area and ending in a mega boss fight that typically provide the best loot and rewards if you can manage to take them down. Getsu is brutally unforgiving. With its rinse and repeat style of gameplay, if you die, you lose everything. And after each boss fight, and oh, by the way, the boss fights are sick, look at these, you're presented with a gate home if you want to keep everything you have, which is something that the game didn't tell me. I wasted about three hours of my life before I finally gave up and Googled, why am I not making any progress? In my defense, why would I have ever have ran past all of these gates at the end of the level without knowing it was going to be there. Getsu has several different main and sub-weapons to mix up playstyles with. Katana, 
hammers, great swords, whips, gauntlets, a big stick thing, dual blades, guns, bombs, spikes, kunai, and even more. Obviously, everything can be improved and upgraded, so use what works best for you. Or I guess, whatever you just happen to find out there on your run. I wouldn't put it up there with Dead Cells and Hades, but if you're a fan of the genre, this is definitely a great addition to pick up. I usually don't like putting two of the same game in the list. I like to try and keep things diverse. You know, a little something for everyone. But in this case, it's just too perfect not to. Little Noah is exactly the same game as Getsu Famude. But at the same time, it couldn't be more different. Where Getsu tries to be just balls hard and unforgiving, Little Noah is a lot more lighthearted fun, encouraging players to see how far they can get on a run and converting everything they found along the way into mana that you can use to upgrade yourself in the hub world. Little Noah has a really interesting backstory too. In 2016, Little Noah was a crummy Clash of Clans clone on mobile. The devs, obviously believing in themselves, decided to completely retool and rework the game into what we see now on consoles. It's funny, after playing this new game and looking back at the old one, seeing the same artwork, character models, enemy types, creatures, reused and repurposed and repackaged into this new adventure. When I saw it in the last part in the mini direct, I passed it off as some lame mobile looking game. Um, uh, you know uh, something looks kind of like a mobile game. But but it's not that at all. It feels really nice and casual to play while still presenting a decent challenge. Actually, due to its nature of rewarding you at the end of long runs regardless, Little Noah provided a much needed break for me when I was playing Getsu. In Little Noah, you don't acquire weapons to attack with. Rather, you collect Pokemon-esque lily pots to attack at your command. Each lily pot has a unique basic attack. It might be a simple sword slash or an elemental blast, maybe an upward projectile or a sweeping strike. You can then organize your collected putts into any order you want. It's super cool and rewarding to try out multiple different attack patterns and combos. And on top of all of that, you can equip any of the 40-ish lily pots as a skill and they each have their own unique special attack you can use at any time with cooldowns. Once you get into a good flow, you can chain together attacks in all different directions. Unleash your special skills, quick zip attack to an enemy and then that resets your cooldowns and you can keep comboing to your heart's content. You also have an ultimate bar that builds up and you can save that up for tough fights or boss battles and unleash your other forms, which by the way, you can unlock even more forms for Noah and they'll add extra bonuses and elemental effects. The areas are fun to explore with tons of challenge rooms that will put extra requirements on the clear bonus to get more rewards. The bosses are a good challenge and there's more to discover as you play. For $15, it's a fantastic little roguelike experience. I was wrong once again about another game. Uh, and that one is a Leckhead. I thought this was just a cute but cheapy $10 platformer with, you know, not much to offer that I hadn't seen before. And yeah, I was very wrong. It's the brilliantly smart level design that really shines here. Forcing the player to think outside the box on every single screen. Whether that means figuring out how to charge up a certain platform so you can reach it or spending 20 minutes in this poop room confused and getting nowhere before you realize you're supposed to go back and forth through this tiny hole you missed. And the poop room was literally a sign that you stink at the game. It's the kind of game where if I try to explain things, it'll just ruin the experience for you. And there is a certain thrill that comes from solving each of these quirky puzzles. Every single screen is a new brain teaser. It doesn't repeat the same idea twice. And while some concepts do build on themselves as the game progresses, for the most part, every new area has a completely different way of approaching it from the ones previously solved. What's here is meticulously well thought out and the perfect little package with no fluff and no filler from start to end. For $10, it's a perfect pickup. Perfect pickup, pick up, perfect pickup. Pick I can't say it twice. Perfect pickup, perfect pickup, perfect. That is impossible, my dude. If you can say perfect, pick up 10 times fast without stuttering film it and send it to me on twitter i'll give you a 20 dollars eShop gift for the first person let me clarify for the first person perfect 
pickup. All right, you ready to feel old? Like I do every day in my 30s. So believe it or not, Bug Snacks released in 2020 alongside the PlayStation 5. Yes, the PlayStation 5 is almost two years old. Did we even need this new gen of consoles? I've played like two games on them. Sorry, Bug Snacks is really fun and it's on Switch now. So throwback to me still in my 20s. I reviewed this game back then and I don't know what was going on with my hair. Why did no one tell me that? That wasn't a good idea. But this isn't a hair review. Um, this is what I said about Bug Snacks then. Bug Snacks started as a heavily inspired by Pokemon Snap style game, but thankfully merged into something much more by adding in elements from Ape Escape, Dark Cloud, and even Viva Pinata. Instead of Pokemans, we got bugs merged with snacks. But of course, we can all agree the best by far is Bunga. So go out there and catch them and shove them down these Muppet-esque weirdos throats and be grossed out as they sprout strawberry legs or curly fry teeth. So to build on what Jennifer Aniston just said there, Bug Snacks is a fun romp around a tasty and somewhat open zone based game with satisfying catching mechanics for these delicious pokey snacks all set around a Muppet murder mystery gone sour. The port to Switch here is pretty nice. I mean, there's some pop in and rough edges, but on the handheld Switch, it's pretty crispy on the screen. I'd say all around, it's a great way to play the game. I mean, the Portal Companion Collection doesn't have a physical yet, but you know that limited run of Play Asia is gonna do one eventually. For now, it's eShop only though, so talk about these games that I played when I was essentially a child. What does one even say about the Portal games? It hasn't already been said over and over the last decade. Two of the highest rated and praised games of all time, specifically Portal 2, which has a staggering near perfect must play score on Metacritic. The Portal games were made by Valve back in the late 2000s and are set within the Half-Life universe. You don't gotta know anything about that. The game focuses on Shell, a woman who is trapped in the facility and forced to undergo a series of tests armed with only the portal gun and promised the sweet, sweet reward of cake once you finish. And spoiler alert, cake is a lie. The insane amounts of fun in this game come from three core places, in my opinion. One, the at its core fun to mess around with portal mechanic. It was mind blowing to just whack a portal somewhere and then shoot one somewhere else and creating a direct link between the two, messing around with gravity and momentum to reach new places and solve different puzzles, which bring us to point two the puzzles. Each puzzle and new area is so brilliantly created and well thought out, always presenting new challenges, forcing you to think outside the box. And three, the humor. The entire game is narrated by GLaDOS, a malicious artificial intelligence who to this day has some of the best quotes in video game history. And in the second game, they're downgraded to your sidekick Spud. And if the price tag for this game is worth anything is to listen to GLaDOS and JK Simmons yell at each other and get themselves motivated to burn down houses. <laughs> also, Portal 2 features a whole extra co-op mode that's separate from the base game, but possibly even more fun. Now, if I told you I grabbed Neon White on Steam so that I could play it on my Steam Deck, um, would you get mad at me? You can't, because I'm sick. It's the rules. You can't get mad at a sick boy. I adore this game, and it's just as worth picking up on Switch as it is anywhere else. Initially, I debated where to buy it, but that's because this game needs to be played in 60 FPS, so I YouTube searched comparisons of the two games, and the difference was completely negligible. The Switch version is 60 FPS, and visually, it's pretty much the same. I ultimately decided to go with the Steam Deck version just so I had something to play on this thing. I know it has my entire Steam library. I just wanted something new. Sue me. <laughs> God, I can't do that voice today. Neon White was a game that as soon as I saw it revealed in a Nintendo Direct, I was 1000% in. A fast paced action platformer that used cards to attack? Sign me up. Funny enough, I feel like the game still flew under the radar until it finally released. And then suddenly everyone seemed to be on board with the concept. I think mostly because word of mouth spread real quick and deservingly so. The game is a blast. Neon White is set in a heaven that's been over 
run with demons and you play as an assassin plucked from hell to slay everything in sight and purge the once holy land. You collect soul cards that you use as discardable weapons, either using them to attack or burning them by activating their secondary ability, which usually has an effect like an extra jump or a speed burst and so much more. It's fun just ripping through the levels and getting to the finish line, but then going back through and cleverly combining the cards and discovering massive shortcuts to slash down your best time is a whole nother level of addicting gameplay. And if you thought all oh, this game had to offer was some fast paced action fun, I gotta tell you, you're completely wrong because there's a whole nother side to the game, a dating sim. Around the levels, you can spend time getting to know the other characters, giving them gifts you find around heaven to unlock new story beats and bonus levels in an attempt to uncover heaven's dark secrets and even try to figure out what happened in your own past life and what led you to getting stuck as a demon slayer slashing around with some smooth moves. Card shock, do 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 do. Card shock, do 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 do. So I may have a little bit of a bias on this next one. Card shock is incredible. Look, I would have said that anyway. But my dear friend Bob and I did interview the creator of this game on our podcast. A shout out to the Nintendo podcast and the creative director of this game, Arno. You can check out that episode right now on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We went into a lot of detail about how he came up with the idea for the game and its unique mechanics. For example, the very start of the game features blackjack, but you're not actually the one playing. Rather, someone you had just met asked you to help them cheat in a game by taking a glance at the opponent's cards while you refill their drinks and then giving them a secret signal back to your new friend on what you saw. This idea is fun on its own, but the delicate balance between trying to quickly take a sneaky peek at the hand of cards and memorize what you're seeing there while also being careful to not overfill and spill the drink you're pouring and then having to remember which direction to wipe down the table to give the correct hint to this terrible cheater. Immediately after this moment too, the game's storytelling shows its true nature as you instantly get caught up in a murder that you uh, may or may not have indirectly caused. The game features many dark themes around the lighthearted fun of card games and even gives you a warning at the start of the game that there may be some tough concepts explored within the game. You end up traveling around with these gambling con artists and you do indeed learn loads of card games and tricks you can utilize yourself to fool people. There's about 28 different card tricks and each one is super rewarding to memorize and then utilize against your poor naive victims. All wrapped up in a charming hand-drawn and painted art style Style, card shock is definitely worth a buy. Or am I tricking you? You'll never know. The sleight of hand. Oh, I'm a rule breaker today, baby. Maybe it's because I'm sick. Maybe it's because I don't care anymore. But we're breaking another rule of my own rules, kind of. <coughs> so the next two are a little bit wild and wacky, but you need you need to you need to work with me here. I think these deserve a spot on the list, and I don't see where else I'm going to talk about them, so I may as well do it here. Let's start with Monster Hunter Sunbreak. Sunbreak is an insanely gigantic addition into Rise that costs forty dollars, and honestly, I just view this as a whole new game with all new story beats and a couple extra cutscenes that take you to a brand new location with new characters, new monsters, new items and equipment, and so much more. The amount of content added cannot be summed up or experienced quickly. It's overwhelming and breathes new life into a game that I had already sunk 60 hours into. I wasn't aware to start the DLC, you'd have to finish the entire base game. That means reaching level star rated hunts and wrapping up the final monster boss. Previously, once you had done that, the game was just over, but you could keep gaining a higher hunter rank by completing everything else in the game. But with this new DLC, it introduces master rank. Yeah, you can go higher now. A whole new rank harder than ever before with tougher fights and a whole new array of monster rank equipment to craft and upgrade. I will say that I thought there'd be a lot more story here. That was just the vibe I was getting by the trailers. It does set you up really nicely with some gorgeous visuals, but then you're just set 
free to run amok in this new location and keep on grinding away either on your own or with friends. I am already re-addicted to this game and putting in a ton more hours and I can't wait to be done with this video so that I can keep playing. All right, now Cuphead, that just got slapped with the delicious last course, which adds six hours of more Cuphead craziness. But for the low, low price of eight bucks, it's surprisingly delicious value. Look, I'm not doing food puns again. The DLC introduces Miss Chalice as a brand new playable character with a new moveset and abilities. You explore a brand new Inkwell Isle with some of the most intense bosses we've ever seen in Cuphead. All new weapons and charms and look, it's more Cuphead for eight dollars. What do you want me to say? You really can't go wrong. I mean, I suck at this game, but gosh dang, that art style gets me every time. It's so damn perfect, and what a smart idea for a game. I need to watch that Netflix show. I've really been slacking on that. Developers.emu or .emu have been handed the key to many castles recently. Something that is fairly rare within the video game creation world. What I mean by that is they're a very talented development team that have been handed the rights to create new games in existing franchises. Just not something you see happen very often. Streets of Rage 4 was their first one that really blew up. They managed to perfectly capture everything that made the franchise successful and release a new iteration in the series and it was a massive success. From there it just snowballed. Keys to Metal Slug and Wind Jammers were handed over to the team and the newest of course Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. And not only did they capture the same magic that the arcade and Super Nintendo Smash hit Turtles in Time did in 1991, one short year after I was born, by the way. Remember I'm old? It's also just one of the best beat-em-ups that has ever been made, and yes, it's still weird for me to say beat-em-ups and not think of myself. It being so good honestly shouldn't surprise anyone, as the team had already had beat-em-ups experience having worked on the Scott Pilgrim vs. The World game, which is still to this day one of my favorite beat em ups of all time and I need to stop saying beat em ups it's freaking me out. Shredder's Revenge is so much classic beat em ups fun and flair. It has everything you would expect. Loads of enemies to wail on, side scrolling progression and tough boss fights but unlike old arcades that would swallow your quarters by the picky bank load, this new version is much more forgiving with so many ways to attack from your own weapons and abilities to using the environment to your advantage, being able to dodge in any direction and huge special attacks that will clear the area around you real quick. The pixel art style speaks for itself. It's perfect and exactly what you would want with the beautiful animations and effects. The soundtrack is straight fire. You can play eight players either locally or online. Are you listening, Nintendo? You can play as the Turtles, April and Shredder. It's super fun, but only a few hours long. I mean, obviously there's a lot of replay value there, but I would take that into consideration when you drop down the $25. Also, it's currently an eShop only game but uh, several different physical versions are coming. So I had to sneak this one out quickly. Limited Run's doing one. I think you can probably buy one at GameStop. Yeah, it's gonna be a thing. Well, that's it. Another 10 eShop games worth buying. Well, actually, I guess seven eShop games for me, one Steam Deck game, and then two big DLCs, but whatever. I really like making these videos and I know you guys like them too. They're still my favorite videos. I always get really excited when it's time to start writing one. I already can't wait to make the next one. Getting real close to episode 30. As long as you guys keep watching these, I will keep making these. They are a lot of work, probably the most work out of any video on this channel, just because of the time it takes to do everything. But I love it. It's so much fun. Thank you. Like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends, your mom, your grandma, your grandpa. Just get, get the video out there to people. Yeah, hey, please do it. Sponsor links down below. Podcast you can go and watch. It's doing very well as well. I have Twitch streams you can go and be a part of. Just join the beat ups community get in the discord follow me on twitter i don't know man what do you want what do you want it's so free it's so free all that is free you don't pay for anything i provide all this free content for you every day every day bye